Basketball Podcast. Welcome back to this episode. This is the second part of a doubleheader. If you haven't heard the first, go back. Go back and listen to it. If you can't be bothered, that's all right. Just keep listening to this one and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. And don't forget, like and subscribe. I hate it when people say that. As Paul mentioned about with the with the front office and people saying this might happen or that might happen, Orlando's quite notorious for not really giving anything away. And almost, if there are rumors happening, yeah, the the opposite almost is one hundred percent going to happen. So if you hear a rumor about Orlando, I've I've it, joked with people. Tristan da Silva is the first is like the first player that was confirmed to work out for the Magic that actually work that actually that they actually picked. Oh really? We know Franz Wagner worked out for the Magic too, but. <laughs> so how i mean in terms of when trades and when these things and that sort of stuff happen with you and your position when do you find stuff out and do you have do they say you can talk about this you can't talk about that yeah like i'll i'll you see usually, people around the facility sometimes and go, yeah Ooh. yeah like i'll i will I, I like i will usually get a heads up maybe like 30 minutes before it breaks with the saying like like essentially saying like hey like essentially saying like kind of on background like hey you know this is what we're working on we're having a press conference or having an availability about it at two you know like at three o'clock um and so like I'll, I'll get a heads up saying like hey this is happening not for publication you know you know you know we're, we're we're meeting with the media for some reason it's like oh why are you meeting with the media well we can't quite tell you yet it's like okay like i can i can do some math from there um like draft night like i knew about the trade probably before that like that that trade was done pretty early on in the afternoon and all of us that were in the facility for the second round of the draft were given a heads up and were told and just told don't report it till it's done until we tell you to and Essentially, none of all of us in the room didn't start confirming it until like Woj and Shams reported it. Once they reported it, it's just like, well, we can't sit on it anymore. Oh, that, that's that's the, the ticker tape, isn't it? It's like the New York yeah. Stock Exchange. Oh, look, there's a Shams or Woj has just yep. said something out. So oh, that's there it is. the deal yeah. then. You, you, you all, it'll be like a gentleman's agreement. You won't say yeah. anything. Someone breaks like, sure. it. It's like, okay, we can go now. It's it's out there now. Like like, what? Well, why why hold on to something we can confirm? Like I like I, I like I, I sit on some Magic fan groups and like people were getting really excited when the Magic's pick was coming up. I was just like, I can't tell you guys not to get not to get excited. Like I like I really wanted to type a few times. Like, hey guys, don't don't get excited about it, please. Like like it's just a second round pick. Come on, because um, like I like we knew we knew like very early on in the day that that they weren't taking the pick that that day. Um. Like I've had, like, I'm not a newsbreaker. So like, I, I'm not out there seeking to break news. Like, I feel like my role in the media landscape is like, okay, I want to be smart analysis of games. I want to be perspective. I, you know, like I'm, I'm a, you know, I am a fan. Like I, I don't hide from that, um, but I've been around this team for a long time. I've covered this team now and been around, around uh, the team a lot in personally. Um, and so like, I want to add perspective and analysis to what's going on more than I'm not trying to be the first guy to tell you that this trade happened. Like there's people that do that and do that, that are going to do that a lot better than, than I can. Um, I have gotten some information here and there on occasion. A lot of it, I was never able to confirm independently. Like I, I'm also, I, I'm trained as a journalist. And so, you know, like the, the, the first rule of journalism is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Um, don't go, <laughs> don't go, don't go and, and report something, uh, that you don't have a, that, you know, that you can't confirm, you know, independently, especially, um, it's like, I've gotten some information here and there that I've fished around and, and never could confirm. And so like, I'm not going to publish that. I'm not going to print that if I can't confirm it. Um, I've gotten information in the past that I was told specifically, do not publish this until either we tell you to publish it or, you know, I've gotten, you know, I, I, I knew about Stan Van Gundy's firing before it, it went public and I was told don't don't confer, don't publish it until someone else publishes it like I was told to be second and I was like I'm gonna respect that I'm not here to burn sport burn sources I'm not here to be that guy like that that's that's that that to me is not the job that I want to do um but you know reporting and journalism is a little bit of information trading so yeah yeah there are a lot of those gentlemen agreements at times and 
a lot of times where, you know, you have to trade information or, or, or do, do stuff like that. And, you know, I'm, you know, that's, that's not, that's not what I, where I see my job as, as at least my role in, in the magic media sphere. How do you separate being a fan in it's moments literally like what that? I was going to ask. So someone <laughs> yeah. says Van um, Gundy's getting fired and you're like, what? And then I mean, you're listening well, to Dwight in fair, talk. In fairness, in fairness, like, we were like we were in the in the media room like uh, 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 another Pacers blogger came down for for that that series against the Pacers and it was after game four they had to go back to Indiana for game five and you know we were telling him the whole weekend it's like look Stan and Otis are gone at the end of the season they're not they're not we we all knew it was happening it was no surprise that it was happening um it was just you know it at a certain point you got to be professional too like i'm trained as a journalist i went to journalism school i have i am a fan i want the team to do well like i i will cheer big moments when i'm at home in in the comfort of my own home um but i have very much trained myself to 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 be when i'm watching a game when i'm focused on what i need to write to to take a step back from my feelings and say okay this is what happened at the end of the day this is this is what happened um and that to me is you know a skill that i've that i've gained and i've learned and and something that i have you know been able to separate that part of me from a little bit you know you can you can kind of see in my background i have plenty of magic stuff like i'm i'm not i'm not going to be ashamed to be a fan but i know how to take that passion and put it off to the side and say you know this is my job this is what i'm working on and what I have to do is I have to be able to look at things through a different lens than, than I than I did when I was five, six years old. I do feel like there should be a stuff the magic dragon behind you though. I'm just saying. I, I, I have a I have, you know, you're right. Um I don't know where my stuff uh my, I have an old stuff doll somewhere. Um I do have a uh you know uh a, a, a turtle with the magic jersey up there. Um <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know where my stuff like you, you can't you can't see my whole bookcase the, behind me, but I got Steve Francis over there. Like that's that's something. Uh, yeah. Palo's up, Palo's up there. I got a couple Dwight's. Got a Patrick Ewing. You know, I got I got I got a good good haul of Magic gear. Well, the first year that uh, I saw um, Dwight playing, I think it was two thousand five, and the girl I was seeing at the time said, "I'll I'll buy you a jersey." I was like, "Great." She went and bought me a Steve Francis jersey. Oh. He left that year, and I'm like, oh, man. Like, you should have got me the Dwight jersey. <laughs> I want you to do that. <laughs> I mean, I have a Steve Francis jersey, too. Like, I, look, I, like, I am, I will, ne like, there are, I will knock Steve Francis for certain things. But I am very much on the camp of Steve Francis's time in Orlando was underrated. He was excellent for what the Magic needed and got from him got ticked off because we had a general manager who didn't really know what he was doing uh and and split him from his buddy in Catino Mobley like that was always a ticking time bomb he was not the answer but Steve Francis was a much better magic player than people remember and, and I I I I, oh, I want player. to I want to make that known Look, Orlando have had some of the I want to say the greatest names in the 90s play for them in in, in terms of towards the end of their career like Ewing Sean Kemp yeah like vince carter well no hang on so you, you you got to say orlando have had some amazing picks as well and some great <laughs> teams would you say orlando the most unluckiest team when it comes to winning a championship based on the picks that we've had ah uh, oh god do you know what just nick Anderson I mean, for, shooting free throws just popped in my mind let's not talk about that uh <laughs> no like <laughs> i think know. orlando <laughs> The reason, I mean, look, the reason Orlando doesn't have a title um, with the picks that they've had, with the players that they've had, it, 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 to me, it's not luck. To me, it is, there were some very bad decisions made at the absolute worst times. Um, and it was, you know, it was unlucky that they got Shaquille O'Neal and he signed a rookie contract the only year where there was no restricted free agency. Um, you know, it was unlucky that the salary cap and salaries really expanded in a way that I that I don't think the Magic predicted or expected, and it cost them you know one of the ten one of the ten best players in NBA history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really un it is unlucky that Grant Hill was hurt, um, and and hurt in the way that he was that he couldn't that he played I think it was thirty two total games with Tracy McGrady. Um, but by the same token, the Magic also organizationally 
made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, not taking care of Shaq, like not knowing how to handle the superstar. You know, I, you know, it was mentioned in the in the documentary. There was a, a an incident where Shaq went home for a, a relative's funeral, but the Magic really wanted him back to play a nationally televised game against the Bulls, and they really put the the screws on him to come back in time. And he got there in the second quarter was emotionally like mentally not there didn't have a good game magic lost anyway to a, to a really good bulls team and then obviously um they lowballed him you know they they didn't offer him the full contract that they could offer him um for whatever reason and you know there are a lot of other things happen you know just again like the salary cap exploded it was definitely a time in history where you know people weren't quite sure athletes should be paid this much and we can debate till forever that why are athletes paid this much it's a fair thing to ask societally but the fact of the matter is they are and like any worker they want to be paid fairly for their market this is their market it's yeah. it's it right or wrong that's their market um and we should you know as as all, most of us being employees we should support employees getting paid a lot um we should support unions uh i don't know how people feel about unions but um, you know, generally, I, like we should support employees trying to make the most money they can. Um, but obviously, they are, you know, there's a disconnect there. Um, you know, Penny getting hurt the way that he got hurt ruined the next phase yeah. of the franchise. Um, Grand Hill getting hurt. But, you know, again, like I look at the Grand Hill situation, a lot of people don't know this. Like, Grand Hill nearly died. He had a staph infection during one of his surgeries and nearly died. And, a lot of that was because Grant Hill felt so much pressure to come back and play for that contract that he signed, that he did that that he overexerted himself. And really, you know what I think the Magic should have done is they should have said, "Hey, pause, get healthy. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about anything else. We believe in you. Get healthy first. You can't play if you're not healthy. So don't try and rush this thing. Don't try and rush your way back. We signed you for seven years." Get back and that never i don't think that ever really happened um and so you have you know decisions like that you have the magic sticking with steam and gundy which i get as well but when it was clear that your star player was kind of chafing with them you know that's kind of maybe when you move on that's when you say okay let's be proactive about this it's passing up on chris paul when he became a free agent to help elevate your team a little bit you know, they stuck with Jameer Nelson and you appreciate the loyalty. Jameer is forever a hero in this town, yeah. but those are, you know, that's a sliding door decision. It's, you know, trading all your assets in the 2010s and the 2011 season uh, in December, you know, Vince Carter, Michael Petrus, Martian Gortat, Richard Lewis for Gilbert Arenas, Jason Richardson, <laughs> Earl Clark, and Hito Turkaloo. Like Jay Rich is a great dude. Like Gilbert is Gilbert. But you hold on to those assets, you know, if you find a way to hold on to those assets for another three, four weeks, Carmelo Anthony became available. Darren Williams, who was a big deal at the time, became available. It's, it, it there are still a lot, you know, going back to like the T-Mac era, reshuffling the entire supporting cast every year, going with some of those aging players that would sell tickets. Like they put Patrick Ewing and Sean Kemp on the marquee. Those guys couldn't play anymore. <laughs> Cycling through those guys hurts your team, especially when you were so limited in what you could do. Not building continuity so you had a team that could grow a little bit while you're waiting on Grand Hill. That killed the Magic. And eventually they, they, they the roulette reel spun and they lost. Um, and they missed the playoffs. Because they could have got um, Tim Duncan at that time as well, couldn't they? They could have gotten Tim Duncan to... You imagine that. Tim I, Duncan, Grant Hill, and Team yeah. Apple on the same team. People, it's like, that's game over. Done. People, people, yeah. But like, and like, even that, it was... You know, people like to point to Doc Rivers not letting Tim Duncan's girlfriend onto the plane. They lost Tim Duncan because they let David Robinson, Greg Popovich, you, you know, corner him in the Virgin Islands and say, hey, you're not going anywhere. They didn't get the last word. And that's what, you know, and he ended up staying in San Antonio and the rest is history. Um, I mean, if the recover. Admiral's talking to you, you're going to listen. Yeah, anyway. Let's exactly. Be fair. exactly. <laughs> David Robinson exactly. comes over to you. You're, you're exactly. There's a pattern that can, with Shaq David Robinson well, cut it? his vacation short. He left Hawaii to go, left his family in Hawaii to go get, go save Tim Duncan. Like, it was close. Do you, do you, I mean, the, the, like I was just saying, there's patterns similar to Shaq, where the Lakers really would, West, Jerry West was oh, they caught it, really they? going for Absolutely. him, wasn't he? Yeah. But yeah. You, would you consider that 
all those decisions historically have now influenced the way the magic are performing their their business now yeah i i think i think there's just a lot more experience um you know i think i think one thing that is really important is like look the magic had you know john gabriel did a great job and and you know he made made, made some missteps maybe toward the end of his tenure but you know he was revolutionary kind of on the cutting edge of how to use cap room like people don't realize like the magic trading scott skiles with a, a first round pick for virtually nothing no one did that and that created the cap room to sign horse grant like people were like what are the magic doing and not realizing oh they're clearing cap room to go sign a big free agent no one did that before john gabriel did that um you know otis smith coming up with the idea and and executing the idea of Rashard Lewis at the four, like no one thought that was possible. Like no one believed in that magic team at all, even after they signed Rashard Lewis, because there's like, oh, he's a three. What are they doing? Like, um, you know, they the magic have always been at their best when they've been revolution, when they've been kind of on the cutting edge of things. Um, and they've had to play some catch up after the Rob Hennigan era. But one thing I would say about Jeff Weltman um, that I felt just kind of being around him and seeing how he's run the organization compared to how Otis ran the organization, how um, how uh, Rob Hennigan ran the organization. Jeff Weltman leans on experience, not just his own, but of his staff, of, of the people around him. And to me, that is what's so different about this team now, is they, under, they understand it's not just about the name, it's not just about we're an NBA team, it's not just about being in Orlando. You've got to create an organization top to bottom that people want to be a part of. And they've worked, I think, really hard to build this this atmosphere, this 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 kind of. This, I know Jeff hates saying this, but the culture. And you can tell that Jeff Weltman has been a part of winning cultures. Like, like you know, you look even look at this summer for the Magic. They are happy to bring back their own players. You know, they're not looking to win headlines. They're not looking to like be told they won the summer. They're happy, you know, the team is winning, the team is doing well. They were happy to bring back almost all of their own roster. They're only adding two new players to the roster this year. They only added three new players to the roster last year. They're comfortable and confident in what they're doing. They've seen results, obviously, in what they're doing too. Um, but they believe in what they're building. They have an organiza a guiding organizational philosophy, both kind of culturally and for the roster. And they're following through on that on every single thing that they do. Like, it's you know, it's a joke that we, like, look for who has the longest wingspan and that's who the Magic are going to pick. But, like, the Magic know what they like and they don't deviate from that. Like, you know, the fans fans had dreams of, like, Anthony Simons and, like, some of the, and Tyus Jones and some of these other players. And I'd be like, those aren't Magic players. Like, I, I can tell you, like, there are things to like about them, but they aren't Magic players. And that matters, too. Who plays on the team at the moment that you would say, oh, they actually could be a Magic player? Are there any ones that stand out for other teams that you would think? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking you I just mean, said like, about Magic like, players. Like, look, give us an like, example look, of like, someone on another like team. Like, we know Jeff Weltman was part of that Raptors organization. Like, yeah. Pascal Siakam is a Magic-type player. Um, you know, guys that the Magic can actually get. Like, when I think about who is the ideal point guard for the Magic, I think it's Derek White. Like the Magic need to go find a Derek White because he's not leaving Boston anytime soon. You could find you like you see like a type player. He is big for his position. He's physical. He defends. Like that's what the Magic like. He's versatile. They want players who can do everything. That's the kind of player the Magic are looking for. Ah, interesting. Derek White. Now, I, you know, I would never have put that together, but yeah, I could see it. I, I've I've got a name for you. I think you you you, you may you may agree with is the could there be a homecoming for anthony simmons from portland so anthony simons <laughs> I, I think he can be um i don't like i think the like the, the magic have been rumored to be going after him for forever everyone's just trying to say like he'd be perfect for orlando and there's a lot of reasons he would be anthony simons has never had to defend in his life um in his nba life uh portland has never asked him to defend and every like this man like Yes, the Magic need to improve their offense. They need to score more points. Yada 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 yada. Um, this team is still about defense, and you do not play for this team if you do not defend. And there is no evidence that Anthony Simons can defend. And I, I think he has the physical tools to do so. 
And I think in the right atmosphere, in the right environment, in the right, on the right team, he would step up to the plate. But he's never had to do it. And so I get the Magic not wanting to spend assets right now to go get him. I, I don't think... I don't think they view him as that right now. If they, let's say they struggle, let's say they're really struggling to score. It's the thing that's holding them back. It's the last thing they need to get over the hump. Maybe that's when they make the compromise uh, on their defense to add some scoring. I don't think they were there this summer and that's why I don't think the Magic went after him. So what so, about Mark or Foles? <laughs> Mark, like Mark do, Hell, do you think that m might happen? Steal of the century he was. <laughs> I, I don't think that I don't think the Magic are bringing back Marco Fultz. No. Um, they only have a minimum contract to offer right now, and I often say this to people, and I know Gary just did this did this um, for the Magic, but um, you do have to kind of think about these guys as employees and and workers too. Would you take less money for for a lower role with the team with the place that you've worked for for the last five years? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think so, and. Um, look, I, I love Marco Fultz to death. I want him to do well. I, I think he's really important for this. I think he was really important for this team and for that locker room. But by the same token, if you want to see what you have in Anthony Black, you got to get Marco Fultz out of the way. Um, because Jamal Mosley is going, and, and I don't blame Jamal for this, he's going to lean on the veteran that he trusts. And Markel Fultz is a veteran that he trusts because he is a magic guy. He will defend. He will play very smart. He understands his limitations and will play within those limitations. He's not going to try and do too much. He is an ultimate team guy. Like he is so important to what this team does. Um, but, uh, but I, I don't see him coming back. So you, that's the first time you've mentioned Jamal. Um, yeah. Obviously we've been talking about Jeff, who's the president of operations of, of Orlando Magic. Um, and you're talking about leadership from top down. Can you explain to people what the difference is when you have like a, a president? Because some people will think of, say, like the Mark Cubans, for example, of this world. Mm -hmm. That would be in the president role. Then Jamal is actually the coach, who, by the way, on his just his own merit, has been absolutely outstanding for Magic. There's, there's no question there. What is that dynamic in the organization? Because when you're talking about players and the influences, it, would you say that Jamal's one is to get them performing and as opposed to picking the players. Yeah, so the way the way it works uh, for the Magic is Jeff Weltman is the president of basketball operations. Um, so he oversees everything that has to do with the team itself, with, with the on-court product. So Jeff Weltman is the one making the kind of final decisions on which players to bring in. Um, he oversees the kind of whole collective staff. So you have Anthony Parker, who's the general manager. You have several scouts that that go around the league that that scout the league that scout college that scout international um and then you have jamal mosley uh who's the head coach and and manages the team on kind of a day-to-day -day basis as far as like getting them ready to play and uh how they play and plays and all that stuff and then you have so like arnie kander is kind of in charge of uh, kind of the lead of the performance staff um they do all the medicals and and physio and, and just make sure that that everyone is healthy um and, and gets through the long arduous season so Jamal Mosley, but like all of these people have to be kind of in lockstep with the philosophy and, and the overarching, overarching thing. And you know, one thing I think Jeff does really well is uh, he listens to everyone and, and like he takes input from everyone and, and trusts the expertise of the people around him. So like Jamal Mosley wants to play the way that Jeff Waltman wants his team to play. Like he wants to use versatility, length. He wants to create a system where everyone does everything. That's kind of where the league is heading right now. You look at the Celtics who just won a title. They don't have a real point guard. Like Derek White and Drew Holiday are point-ish guards. But they can play off the ball. They can play on the ball. They have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown who make good decisions. Christoph Porzingis makes good makes decisions with the ball. They play this amorphous, like kind of positionless basketball. That's something Jeff Weltman's after too. And so Jamal Mosley's implemented, and he's done this, I think, really well over the three years that he's been here. Um, Jamal Mosley's implemented an offensive system that allows players to make decisions and learn how to make decisions more importantly. Um, beyond that, he's created a defensive system that everyone's bought into. And Mosley, Mosley's done this by just being a, like, a real person and, uh, and by connecting really deeply with the players and being invested in them individually. Um, Jamal Mosley has a player development background. He came from the Dallas Mavericks, where he was kind of Luka Doncic's favorite coach. Um, someone that just connects really deeply with, with a lot of players. And a lot of players play really hard for him. 
And obviously, the you know, you're watching the Magic. They play really hard for him. They really believe in this guy. They really want to do well for this guy. Um, you know, it's it, the, the joke around the league is that Jamal Mosley is the kind of coach that players don't want to fail. Like, they don't want him to fail. Um, and so... You see that, and and that, and that started with the groundwork that he laid three years ago, and everyone just being really invested in what he's saying and, and believing in what he's saying, and him, you know, having them believe in him, like him earning that trust, and it's it, it goes beyond just basketball. I think with him, like I think he's he's been really good for this young group to like treat them as young men and meet them where they are, as much as trying to dictate what they're doing on the floor. So, what do you think the the expectation for Orlando Magic is coming up this season. I mean, is it still to avoid the play-in? Is it to get to that top four? Uh, I mean, if you ask the players, they will say they expect to have home court advantage. Um, they want a top four seed this year. And a lot of that is they went through a playoff series where the home team won every game. If that if game seven were in Orlando, I believe they think they would have won. And and I have no reason for that, no reason not to believe that. Um, I think for me, just taking a step back, my expectation is for them to get back to the playoffs. Like, show us that you can do it again. You did it once, do it again. Um, and I, I would say, like, again, have another competitive series, get to the second round. Like, obviously, the growth, you know, you want to see a team grow and, ex and expand their game. Um, the growth, the next step of growth is win a playoff series. You didn't win a playoff series last year. The next thing to do is win a playoff series and get to that next round, get to that second round. Um, to me, that is... I, I don't think I don't think the season is necessarily a failure if they don't get to the second round, but they need to look like a team that's going to compete for the second round, and, and I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for them this year. And just moving away now, I think from the actual the team itself, and and back to yourself, Philip. What does game day look for you? So game day for me, uh, if it's a home game. Uh, I they usually do a shoot around in the morning, so around like 10 45, 11. So I head, to, I, I'll go to the training center uh, and talk to the players before the game. Then, um, then come home, try and write some write some stuff, um, and then I'll usually head to the game. I usually get to the games around 4:30 when the doors open for media. Um, you know, get a you know kind of get settled in, get a feel for the atmosphere. You know, go out go out to court, watch watch some warm ups. Um, we talk to the both coaches before the game, uh, and then. You know, it's a lot of talking to other media members, getting a sense of what they're thinking and and, and what we're expecting for the game, just kind of figuring out what the storyline's going to be for the game. Um, but, you know, it's it's waiting for the game. You know, like when, when the game starts, you know, you're locked you're locked in as much as the players are uh, in some respects. Um, just kind of like figuring out, okay, what's going on? What's important in this game? What's, what's going to matter? What's going to be memorable about this game? To me, that's what I really think about is how does this game fit into the larger story of the season? Um, and... You know, some days it's, oh, this surprising guy had a really big game. Sometimes it's this guy made the big shot. Or sometimes it's, there's a trend that you're noticing that you're following. And it's like this trend popped up again. And now we got to really break down like this, why this is happening and what's going on there. Um, so usually like I will leave the arena around, the game ends maybe like 9, 15, 9, 30. You talk to, talk to play, players after the game. I'll usually leave the arena around 11.30. So I'm, I'm there a good seven hours. Like a game day is a full day of just kind of being enveloped and engrossed in, in the game. That's amazing though, isn't it? That is amazing. Uh, do you ever get to have any opportunities to go to the away games? Cause I, you did post that you went to a few last season. I went, I went to a few, I went to, this year was actually the first time I've ever gone to road games and, and they're, you know, a, a lot of the, a lot of it is the same, but a lot of it is different. Um, you know, the joke that I make is like when the team is home, they know where to hide in the building, uh, so they don't have to talk to us. Um, it there's a lot fewer places to hide. You're kind of meeting new people, which is which is really cool. You know, talking to to other reporters as well. Um, you're you're you know a little bit of a fish out of water. Like I remember I went to Miami twice this year, and the first I, I'd been I've covered games at the Casilla Center before. But like the first time walking around, I was like, I have no clue where I'm at. I got to figure out where I'm going. Um, the second time I was like, okay, I know exactly what the deal is now. Like, I feel like, I feel like I'm very, com I, I'm fairly comfortable here um, now. And it was like, it was that way with Cleveland too. I went to all, I went to all four games on the road in Cleveland for the playoffs. The first time I, I did a lap around the building because I couldn't find the media room. Um, the second time I was like, okay, I, I know, I know where I'm going now and, and what, what the deal is. And how, do, how do the, um, how do you, do you look at the media responding to the way in which podcasts have been embraced? 
because it's a different meat. It's a, you know, we like them, obviously. You yeah. Do. But, um, and our listeners do. But it is, we feel more personal very much in a way, in a, a personal way of giving information across, and as well as opinions, but obviously facts among those. How do you think that old media world that, you know, we, we talked about earlier with TV rights and that sort of thing, they find podcasts confusing sometimes and don't know where to put them. Yeah, it's it's definitely an adjustment. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think, gener- and this is generally been my experience. If you are a podcast, if you're a blogger, and you come to the topic with seriousness and with professionalism, you will be respected by the the older media. They they may be a little bit annoyed. Um, you know, if you yeah, I like I was told the first time I went to a game, you know, let the sentinel let the guys on deadline get their stuff done first like you're you know you you know what you are like you know let them get their stuff in first be deferential to them and then like i'm always deferential to them like i I, i'm more seasoned now i'm like probably the guy that's been on the beat the longest now um so i i definitely push for my own stuff more but like everybody who knows me and everyone knows how i approach things i come at it from a very professional professional very serious standpoint i'm not just i'm not here to be a fanboy i'm not here to cause problems. I'm not here to be combative or, or confrontational. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to be professional. I'm going to be here every day. I'm not going, to, I'm not going anywhere. I understand the, like how the industry works. And so I think that if you prove yourself in that way, um, that you are going to treat this seriously, you are going to be professional. You're, you are going to, you know, be, you know, you're going to add something to the group, to the group stuff you're going to be respected and you're going to be kind of welcome into the group. It, I think the problem that a lot of traditional media have with kind of newer media, if, if we're going to call it that, is if you're just kind of out there for clickbait, if you're just, you know, make, if you're trying to be confrontational for no reason, um, you know, or, you know, you don't know how to be, how, you know, there is a political aspect to being a journalist. Like, like, you know, we, we, you know, I think we tend to lionize journalists as like there are these all these new, there's always these neutral parties and it's like no like that like that is part of it but I think there's a lot of there's not a lot of literacy as far as like how journalism actually works there is a little bit of political gaming going on like I know I've got to talk to the coach every day for the next next three months I'm not gonna come out and be combative with him you know unless there's a real question that i need to ask that 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 may feel a little combative but i may try and phrase it so it's not combative because i got to deal with them for the next you know however i got to deal with them for the rest of the season um i don't want him you know like there there is a little bit of that give and take that you gotta you gotta realize about the job um you know like people are going to place information with people that they trust but also people that they can some that, that you know i always tell people whenever someone gets a rumor or link or, or rumor or story the first question you got to ask is not really about what the rumor is like i don't care what the rumor says it's why is this being leaked and why is it being leaked to this person um you know like i'm not gonna you know like like that that to me that's that's the bigger question that i always ask when i see these things is why why is this being leaked like who's benefiting from this and what what does it actually tell us like i like honestly say i i told my writers all this all the time i don't care about the fake trade i don't care about your rumor why is the rumor important what what compels you to write about it because a fake trade is fake it's not real approach it with some with some serious approach it with some seriousness and some 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 uh, idea of its impact or idea of what it means or what it might mean or why this is gaining traction with people like scratch a little bit deeper um so i think what a lot of old media is kind of frustrated with is people who aggregate their stuff without attribution or try and like leech traffic from them because we we're all in a business too like we all have to make some money um it's stuff it's stuff like that it's people who, who don't treat the job seriously who feel like they're fans in the building um like that that's the yeah. stuff that that i think they 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 grade against but if you treat your subject with seriousness if you treat it with professionalism you know you're part of the group you're you're part you're part of the industry and, and i think that's that's what they're looking for and i, I would definitely you know just from our side of the pond is you know your reputa- repre- reputation and everything that your work and your craft that we've seen that you've do you've done for over a decade um especially that even more cool 
Yeah. Especially, I think that's so, so difficult to be critical of a team where you're a fan of yeah. it. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, and be very, I mean, and very... Like, and like, look, like, I, like, and I, I come at it from this too, and I, I admit this bias. Like, I, I will be critical say, I will, I would not have done it this way. But I will also, but I will also say like, look, I'm not going to call for someone's head over something tiny or something inconsequential if I can sit here and say like, oh, I get the logic though of what they're doing. If I can understand your logic, it's just like, okay, as long as like, I often tell people like, I'm not going to be overly critical of something unless I just don't understand the move. Like if, if it makes no sense, then I'll be like, that makes no sense. What the hell are we doing? But if I can say, okay, I get what they're trying to do here. I, I don't agree with it. It's not how I would have spent it, but I'd rather say like, let's see how it plays out. Ultimately, I'm not making the decision. Um, so let's see how it plays out. Let's judge someone based off results rather than what you think they should have done to begin with. And can I just say, based on the results of your career, it highlights to me as with that longevity yep. that you have got a very strong relationship with the Orlando Magic because obviously yeah. you have that trust there. And this is actually my leading to my last question was when you have that relationship with an organization like that, but you also have a relationship with the coaches and the players. Um, do you ever find it difficult to detach yourself away from the emotion when Great. a coach goes or Great question. your favorite player is traded or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, I would say this since it's, I start like, Growing up, I was all about the team. Um, like I was like the Magic could do no wrong. You know, like I'd boo, you know, boo Shaq, boo T Mac. Like you know, when they when they came back and they left, it was less like it was like you're betraying the team. I would say since I started covering the team, I have come to appreciate and respect a whole lot more the work of everyone on the team. And I would say like I am more, I'm more player coach. Like those are my people. Like those are the guys that I would go to bat for. Like I like. Like I just mentioned, like it sucks that Markel Fultz is not going to be back. Like this is a cold, terrible business. I I could sit here and say like I don't think Markel Fultz is the answer, and it 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 hurts because that dude is such a great guy, and I want I want him to succeed. Like I have seen how much work he puts in. I have seen how far he has come. I want him to succeed. I want desperately for him to succeed. Um, and it it you know it hurts me that it isn't happening here. Like. Nikola Vucevic is one of the nicest dudes in the world. I, I love, I love him. I love him to death. And, you know, I, like we have the kind of relationship, you know, like I waited after the Magic's win over the Bulls uh, at the end of the season. Um, I waited to just say hi to him and, and kind of walk him back to the bus and just, just catch up with him. Cause I haven't seen it. You know, I hadn't like, I, I had a day job before. So I, like, I was, I wasn't able to go to the Magic Bulls games and say, see him since the trade, um, you know, I want him to succeed so bad. It, it hurt when he traded. I understand, like, I, like, the journalism brain understands. Like, I am not, like, I'm not so attached and so friendly with people that I don't get why the Magic are doing things or why, you know, that this business is really cold and really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, it, it, you can't be so emotionally attached to players because that's, you know, eventually everyone is a, as a trade asset too. I, it's a part of the job that I hate is that, everyone is is an asset they're not always people um but you know it's a small world in the nba um you know you could still be a fan of a person even if they're on a different team and you could still say like that's gonna be a great situation for them that's that's gonna be great that's gonna be fun like you know like evan like evan fournier is probably gonna sign a new contract in in europe he's gonna probably go back to france and it's just like i want him to be successful i love that dude like that that's a guy i've worked with you know like did you see him like, last night uh, I, I saw him a couple days ago. I know they're playing right now as we're recording, oh, but yeah. Orlando, but... Uh, sorry, Orlando is it's France versus Germany. Germany, yeah. Um, yeah, he got in a. They're saying he got a little an, bit of a, a, a brawl. Evan, it wasn't Evan, a brawl. Evan, it just grabbed Evan's, him. Evan's always kept it real. Like you, you know how Evan feels about things. Um, but like, like, you know, like I, I remember when the Nuggets won the championship. Like I tweeted and expressed, like I am so happy for Aaron Gordon. Like I am so proud of the title, and it was just like isn't the right situation for him to be the version of himself that he's like like why yeah. i was i was around him for seven years like like i like I, I i will tell young reporters this like you know don't be a fan don't be like sitting in the stands cheering but if it is impossible to be around a group of people and not want them to succeed like don't ever be so callous 
that you yet you won't that you don't want the people that you're working with and that you're around not to succeed like i like i i was a freshman in college covering covering softball uh covering the softball team they went to the women's college world series that year and and i was i had to write it and i had to like cover it i was heartbroken when they lost because because all those girls were just the best like i loved be, i just loved the energy around them i love being around them and and you know feeling like you're kind of in not necessarily in their corner but you're that 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 you that you understand the work that they're going through and that you want them to succeed that i honestly i think that makes you a better reporter too just because you're you know not that you you're not critical when you need to be or you're not fair and balanced when you need to be but you know that's how that's how you gain a connection with the people that you're covering and you're writing for and and you know it's more fun obviously to cover teams that are winning trust me teams that win are a lot more fun to cover they're a lot more fun to be around um this year was the single most fun season we i've had covering the magic it was just everything was awesome um but you know you have to you know you still have to look at them as people and i think that's the biggest thing that i've i've learned being around the players a lot more mark i know you want to ask your questions but I, i've got one last question just based on what philip just said there which is do you pinch yourself sometimes i know you stay professional but do sometimes you just go wow this is awesome Oh, like, yeah. I, I, oh yeah i'm I'm like at a magic training center watching the guys you know i mean it's 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 not so much those moments you know just you know yes like you know it like it's not you know like that just feels so rote now but like you know i still like think about like wow like game six was awesome like that was just so much fun like as as it's you know like you're working you kind of take a moment to like take it all in but like game six of that playoff series was just amazing like amazing like you know I, like i pinched myself i got to cover a game at madison square garden like that was like just being like it took it took it took a quarter and a half to be like i am in madison square garden watching a basketball game um like that, that like be like i was able to be on the floor for a little bit and like you know like i, I actually saw, said hi to evan he was still on the knicks at the time um uh you know and i think i surprised him that i was there um but like that like that's that's part of it that's part of it too like you have to you do have to like i think if you have the opportunity Take a moment to just just realize where you are and what you're doing, and it, it, it's, it's just awesome. So, if you had, if you could, if you had the the power of one for a day, uh, in the Orlando's organization, for example. Oh wow, you're doing it just for Orlando? This question? No, no, I'm just doing this just for example. If you just did, okay, that one. What would what? Oh, this job isn't would you your do? Shot, shot question. Not my shot question. I'm just thinking. You were saying about what could happen for this season going forward? What one thing would you want to influence or potentially change going into this following season? We haven't had all the trades. I'm sure there's other things that will unveil before the season starts, no doubt. That's just the way the world works. But as it stands right now with the teams, let's assume Suggs is in the team. What would you, who would you want to influence um, the most? Like, like influence, like in what way? Well, would you, if you could uh, change the approach for the coaching team, the conditioning team, the strategies, the would you what have different players um, in? The, yeah, you know, I honestly. What one like, change would you want to do, Phil? I mean, I think the biggest, like, the biggest thing the Magic have to do this year is is take more threes. Um, you know, they are 29th in the league in three-point field goal attempts. And look, they weren't a good three-point shooting team last year, so I get not taking a ton of threes. But um, I think that's a big thing that's holding them back is this is a three-point shooting league right now. Um, and I think I think just increasing the volume a little bit, it's only like two or three more attempts per game, get up to 35 instead of 32. Um, I think with the improvement that you expect from shooting, especially from Franz, um, I think that that would transform the offense like the reason why clay thompson was interesting to me as as an offseason acquisition and you know again who knows how real that um three but he took eight threes a game because you you can't ignore clay thompson he is clay thompson <laughs> he's one of the best shooters of all time um to me that is that is where this offense needs to improve or where where, where it needs to go next yeah hey we got to say last time we were in orlando we got quite a few ch free chick-fil-a's because of their three-point shooting yeah they may make enough threes to get the chick-fil-a but <laughs> but we 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 like 
It's Love what, the Chick Fil A promotion. It, it, we need wins. We need W's. We need it, W's in May and June. That's what we're. That's Philip, what we're that was going. the shocking thing though when they would say right, if they hit five or more, and you think five. I think like, they did it in a quarter. Yeah, we it's just it's like, ridiculous. Yeah. But we, you know, we fully expect them to 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 be doing more than that. But the reason I was asking that question, and I'm so pleased you answered it that way. You, you like stats. You you like looking at the numbers and. We had a, a, an era, it's fair to say, where I won't say the money ball approach to basketball and a lot of sports where it was, we're looking for the win in total. So these are the metrics and this is how you're going to get there. It kind of feels like basketball may have changed a little bit from that. Do you see that? Uh, yeah, a, a little bit. You know, I think, I think. It, you know, everything's always call and response. So, you know, the, the league started shooting a lot more threes. We saw teams get smaller to, to try and combat that. I think we're starting to see the league actually get bigger again. Um, and, you know, one thing, you know, and I think this is one thing, you know, we talk about the Magic always being on kind of the cutting edge um, when they're successful, at least. The Magic are bouncing back, it feels like, to embracing this kind of positionless basketball where you have these really skilled players in positions you're not used to them being skilled. I have to call it like, it's not just positional versatility, it's skill versatility. Um, and so you look at the Celtics, and I think the Celtics are going to kind of overdrive this where skill matters as much as shooting. Like you need shooting to spread the floor, but now this next step is, oh, Luka Doncic is a six foot seven point guard. You know, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can create. Paolo and Franz can create where, you know, the Magic don't have a traditional point guard. A lot of people wanted them to get a point guard. And I still think that's a need that the Magic have. But ultimately, the Magic said, we don't want to take the ball out of Paolo and Franz's hands. They're our creators. No one can no one can figure out what to do with a 6'10 creator, and we got two of them. <laughs> so let's, that, that's, to me, that's where the league is evolving next. And, you know, again, Victor Wendanyama is a great example of this. He's a 7'5 guy who plays like a guard. Like, and he does it well. It's not like a novelty. It's like, oh, he's actually pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, that's where the league is headed next. Amazing. Right. We can't wrap this up without getting that clutch shot so if you have that one person and we're gonna we're gonna limit you to orlando magic history okay so the one player well hang on if you limit him to orlando he still might pick an orlando player that's what i'm saying he's gonna pick an orlando player i'm gonna pick an orlando player (laughs) so that what who's the one orlando player that you say that's the clutch player they're gonna hit that game time shot it's Game seven. This is the winner. Oh, he knows the answer. Right? I can tell I mean, by his oof. face. I, I'm, 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 I'm. It's not Nick like, Anderson. My, my initial, my initial answer is Tracy McGrady, just because he's the yes. best creator in Magic history. But Petty had a lot of really good game-winning shots. Uh, Hedo obviously had his. Um, Richard had some. Mm. Uh, I'm going to stick with T Mac because you know, even though he didn't have a lot of game-winning shots in Magic uniform, just he's just the best on-ball creator and 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 you know, kind of shot maker that the magic have ever had yeah um so i'm gonna stick with t-mac but i i gotta give special shout out to to i gotta i gotta give a special shout out to steve francis to to <laughs> richard lewis you know turkaloo paolo obviously he's had some big shots jameer nelson had some big shots um and and of course pat garrity had some humongously clutch shots throughout his career so uh that's i'll but i'll stick with t-mac for the sake of this this question uh, you got uh, just throw this in there i don't know why this popped to my head but t-mac's possibly got the greatest shoe of all time as well he does that was yeah. my first basketball shoe yeah what not the am one tai chi that one not the one that was like no. the am one tai chi the but t-mac the t-mac 2 there was a, the yeah, t-mac yeah, 2 yeah. that was the one i was thinking of it's, it had that colorway with the white blue all right last um, question mark yeah philip's got an exclusive five, to go to five and five pine. pine so you it can be the all-time five and one on the bench or it could be just magic five. or everyone Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Oh God, uh, you're gonna put me on the spot. And when, when I'm a, a little time crunch here, um, you can uh, keep it magic if you, you can want. keep it magic. That's whatever fine. you want to I do. I mean, keeping it magic makes it easier. Uh, like, do it. like my five all-time like favorite players. Let's go with that. Um, okay. Penny and T Mac are my guards. Like those, those are those are my guys for life. Um, I was I I always have just such tremendous respect for Richard Lewis. Um, just the guy just worked hard um you know like he he was the highest paid player on the team did not need to act never needed to act like he was the highest paid player on the team just absolutely love uh everything about just love who richard lewis is as a person um 
Uh, I would put Dwight. Dwight is my guy. Like I love Shaq to death. I was very young for Shaq. Dwight. Dwight is the guy that really taught me what basketball is. Um, so I am, I am very much a, a Dwight person. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, I need a four. Uh, I, I'm always a big Horace Grant fan. And then finally, I, I'm going to go with Daryl Armstrong off the bench. Love a bit of Daryl. His energy was awesome just watching him run around like he could have been sponsored by red bull that man had so much energy <laughs> right thank you so much philip let's uh end this by saying it's been an absolute privilege on my part to listen to you consistently on your podcast you've got shows coming up you said and they'll be coming down uh to three a week is that right? It's sorry, muted. In, sorry, I'm muted. In, in September, yes, we'll be cutting down, cutting down to three, three weeks. Fantastic. Well, that's locked on with Magic Podcast. Go listen to Philip; he's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for joining us. I have been Mark. I have been Paul, and we've been talking to Philip Rossman Reich, the Orlando Magic voice. Um, actually, the Orlando voice, I would say, for many sports. He's been an absolute legend. Thank you so much for gracing the podcast with your presence. Thank you. 